Welcome, Welcome to, to Happy, Happy Wife, Wife Happy, Happy Life. Life. We're your hosts. I'm Kendall Landrin. And I'm Jordan Myrick. We are two incredibly unqualified. But deeply in love comedians who are here to help you with all things dating, love, sex, relationships, and more. And today, oh, we just have the most special guest in the whole world. We're here with Sarah Shower, and we're going to be talking about alcohol and dating. Hey. for doing the podcast thank you so much for having me of course it just this makes so, sense it's so wild having like thank you so much for coming because usually sarah and i we, we have a podcast together so i know usually, i've never been on it usually <laughs> you're the <laughs> guest be on it. i've never been on it <laughs> we should have a podcast we should yeah, yeah. just like, go ahead and complete the circle exactly. yeah <laughs> what would our podcast be about oh crap you mm. knowing me yeah. There's one common denominator. That's, That's sick. We just talk about Kettle the That's entire disgusting. time. Yeah, we talk shit about Kettle Here's the whole time. my professional opinion, and you're like, well, here's my intimate opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we agree. <laughs> okay, we'll workshop that after, because I love that. Well, um, thank you so much for being here. We're talking about alcohol and, and dating today, but before mm-hmm. we get to it, how was your week? It's been really good. I, um... I think I developed latchkey incontinence. I just said this. <laughs> so latchkey incontinence is that feeling of when you put your key in the front door and then you're like, I got a pee. And so then I pee every time I go to the front door, but now every time I enter a doorway, mm. I have to pee. And so like I try to stay to one room while I'm working. Where did you learn this? <sighs> Books. Trial and error? Yes. Oh, no. Yeah, I was like, what's this phenomenon? But also it came up in some books. Is that connected to um, when you you think you have to pee, kind of, but then when you get to the bathroom and you're, like, trying to take your pants off, you're like, oh, my God, I'm really going to pee myself? I don't no. think that they're related. I think that's just a different pee thing. Disconnected oh. from your body. <laughs> yeah. I think it's just, like, you're holding it, but then once your brain knows you're close, your body doesn't have to work as hard to hold it because they're like, oh, you're about to be able to pee. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you feel like you have to pee worse, I think. I'm sure there's a name for that. There's a name for everything. Yeah, yeah. it all has to do with, like, conditioning in your brain. Sure. Wow. Yeah. Your bell. That's you salivate. <laughs> yes, yeah, very Pavlovian. You have to make sure you're not peeing too much, though. I that's know. bad for you. That's what I worry about so I'm like hold it or stay in the room but no but I've heard people like oh you don't want to let yourself pee too much because then you train yourself that you have to pee all the time but also people have been like it's so bad for you to hold a bunch of pee in you mm-hmm. because yes both are true it's so bad to hold a bunch of pee in you yeah but it's bad to pee all the time yes. because you don't have a bunch of pee in mm-hmm. you all the time yeah so you have to pee when you actually need to pee but if you constantly get the sensation there's no way there's that much water yeah. in you yeah so you don't actually have to pee does that make sense yes. yeah yeah actually this does relate a lot to alcohol and drinking yeah I guess. yeah breaking the seal <laughs> yes 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 that's very true um how was oh. your week jordan my week was good i just got my engagement ring do you want to see it oh my god no, we just got it it's oh, so I love cute that. kendall got one because kendall got proposed to which is fine that's how i wanted it but then <laughs> i was like i don't know if i'm ever gonna find a ring that i actually like because all yeah. of them looked so different than they did online when i yeah. saw them in real life and then i saw this one and i was like that's probably gonna look different too so i didn't go look at it but then one day we were sitting at din tai fung and i was like you know what we should just go over there and look at that ring yeah, yeah. and i did and it was perfect yeah, it's, it was honestly, it was hard to find Jordan one because I do feel like a lot of them, like mine's pretty very traditional, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and the place I got mine from, I feel like you were trying to mix and match things to be mm-hmm. like, oh, this kind of looks a little different. But I was like, I think you just want something fully. But it's hard to find. So Jordan would go and be like, I kind of want an untraditional ring. And they would show you this ring that looked like something that like a cult member would wear. Do you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Like yes. a really like burning man, like made of like a fork that they've like Scientology. put down. Yes. Yeah. We were like, no, no, that's not what we're looking <laughs> yeah. for. I want it to look like a ring. But that, yeah. there was no in between. And so I think it was hard. Or like, they'd be like, oh, untraditional, come over here. And it would be like skulls all over it. And we're oh, like, yeah. no, we yeah. just want like one that's not fully traditional. So I feel like that is like the perfect one. So, oh, I love Should it. I show them? And yeah, get in there. If you can't, if you're listening, he- head over to YouTube. Yeah, go Wait, follow did, the Happy Wife Happy Life. Do Instagram. an audio description of it for the listeners at home. This yeah. is how you know Sarah is a podcast professional. Okay, so it's a vintage Todd Reed ring. The ring itself is palladium, which is similar to platinum. And <laughs> you're gonna say plastic. I was like, mm-hmm. like uh oh, no, <laughs> harder. It's similar to 
uh, what's it called? Now I want to <laughs> say plutonium. What's it called? Platinum. 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 Okay, yeah. it's similar to platinum, but it's palladium. And then there's three stones in their own little like gold boxes. The two side stones mm-hmm. are unpolished diamonds. Okay. So they're gray and uh, more matte looking. And then the center stone is square, but like off kilter so uh-huh. it's like diamond shaped instead of square does that make sense yes and it's a normal diamond and i got it at artisan la which is a jewelry store that is owned by two gay men who have been married for like 20 30 years, years. Mm-hmm. um and they met in new orleans which is where i'm originally from mm-hmm. and they were just so nice and gave us such a wonderful experience i think anyone should go there for any jewelry needs whatsoever okay. this is not an ad i just really really loved them no mm-hmm. it's very nice because also one thing like when we were shopping for engagement rings i did feel like um uh, every place went was great, but sometimes you go into a place and it is very LA, where it's like yeah. these twenty five year old women being like, "And what do you want?" And it just kind of kills the romance a little bit of it. Yeah, you're like, and they're like, "Okay." Um, we also every ring store only has like a, rings made for babies. Oh yeah, that's the like, worst part of it. They were like, "Try it on." It's like a size it would four. get barely yeah. below my fingernail. Yeah, and then I would be like, "Oh, it's um, beautiful. it looks <laughs> small. I don't know what to say. I don't know how I'm supposed to spend a lot of money on something that won't even fit on my finger." It's yeah. so wild. But I wanted something secondhand because mm-hmm. that's the most sustainable. So that was really important to me. And I just liked these men that sold it to me. And it was on <laughs> sale, which wasn't necessary. But I love shopping on sale. I love fitting, shopping It just secondhand. felt like another thing that was perfect oh, I love for using you. a coupon. So yeah. this is perfect for me. And if you're listening, just know it's the most beautiful ring you've ever seen in your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, congratulations, Jordan. <laughs> Thanks, Kendall. <laughs> congratulations congratulations on your purchase. Thank you. Um, well, we're so excited to talk today. Sir, do you want to talk a little bit, first of all, about why you're our guest for dating an alcohol? Um, so I am an alcoholic, but I'm, uh, what's the month? One year. April? Yeah. One? It's March. One year. <laughs> the worst. 15 against- months sober. One year and 15 months. No. no one year. And- <laughs> that would be so, that would be like, I'm like telling you about like my child. Your baby, yeah. Yeah, I'm a 48 months yeah. sober. No, um, no, I'm 15. 15 months sober. Congratulations. Thank you. It's so exciting. We're really proud of you. It's so crazy. I like, um, don't, I just wake up and I read in the mornings and I don't feel hungover, which is crazy. But I still have like very strong sense memories of alcohol. Sure. So that's like, I thought that that would go away. You know? What do you mean sense memories of alcohol? Like, I can still, if I picture alcohol long enough, I can taste it in my mouth. Wow. Yeah. Maybe that's just the blood. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> it's, but yeah, I can, um, and I can still, like, if I think about a, a hangover long enough, I can feel it. Sure. Wow. Yeah. The brain is very powerful. It is. Were the hangovers just because this is what I've never, it's not that I haven't understood about alcoholism, because I guess if it was just easy to be an alcoholic, I guess it wouldn't be a, a big deal. It's actually fairly easy to be an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, what are you talking, yeah. anyone can do it. <laughs> but I guess I was always just like drinking we don't really drink anymore not yeah. like out of a not out of any we don't believe, like I'll do it ever so often but it is too hard it is like way too hard on me where yeah. I will drink two cocktails at a dinner and then like a week later I'm still like I'm sorry I, I'm still having to stay in bed until noon because I am I have such a bad migraine and it like my yeah. body aches and I can't do anything yeah. and I'm like so whenever I hear um, people drinking like a handle a day I'm like how were you doing anything well, I mean, your like your tolerance goes incredibly like high up. You know, I assume if either of you are on medication, it's probably at an elevated dose. Sure. Um, and yeah. if I took it, I'd probably, unless it was like something you had to build up over time. Like I took it, I'd be like, oh my, what the hell? Yeah. You know, but if you build up a tolerance, then it becomes like harder and harder to like fill the, like feel the effects of alcohol. Sure. Even in the hangover. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I when you drink consistently enough. You don't really get hungover. It's like a oh, hair wow. of the dog situation. Yeah, because you're always drinking. We both lived in New York. It would, people yeah. would be like, every night, you. the only place we can hang out is a bar. So mm-hmm. every night we drink, you know, five drinks. And it's like, yeah. that's not normal. Yeah. Um, but it gets very normalized. Or I know people who like go to, or in frat parties, sort of, they'll be like, I drink 20 shots a night. And I'm like, man. And so I think there are things that are normalized where you can't, when you look back, you're like, whoa, that's wild. Yeah. It's kind of crazy to, you, you just no like concrete way to like diagnose an alcoholic, but usually people go for like the amount that you drink when there's like several factors. It's like how much you drink, how frequently you drink withdrawal symptoms and what you drink for. And so like, once you evaluate like four, there's like a fifth one, mm-hmm. but he's elusive. Um, <laughs> and if, if you meet like the criteria, then it's like, 
you're likely in the alcoholic zone. But if you're like, yeah. if you drink five drinks when you go out once, you don't have, you don't wake up the next morning and being like, I've lost control. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Like it's there's a it's not, not purely about amount. Sure. Yeah. Man, well, thank you so much for being here to be vulnerable about this because that's so exciting. Fifteen months sober. sober. That's why it's crazy because when I met you. You were or like, like <laughs> maybe <laughs> I do always feel bad because the first like time one of the first times we met you like came over to my house and I was like here's a bunch of wine like yeah. I didn't know I was just like do you want some wine which and is also had- so funny because we don't drink wine and we don't drink at home but I remember Kendall being like okay I'm having another adult over what do you do <laughs> wine you put out wine yeah got it we've literally never drank wine at home ever one no, time but in I always lives. have it in our house to be like yeah when someone comes over do you like a glass of wine yeah. I'm like wow that's the adult thing to do um but then I feel like a couple of days later you were like I'm uh gonna I'm gonna be sober now and I was yeah. like oh sorry I probably was playing uh, uh, maybe I I hope I wasn't the reason that no. <laughs> put you over the edge. No, no, that one singular night did not like. T- you know, that'd be kind of funny if you were my breaking point. <laughs> I was like, I've got to get it together. No, it's um, I was just kind of like, I gotta, I really gotta get sober. I feel like I'm missing a large part of life, and I was gonna do like dry January, mm-hmm. and then I got to February, and I was like, I feel great. Let me keep doing this. That's awesome. But it's kind of fun. The last person I got drunk with was Laganja Estranja. Wow. Um, like we were just talking the entire night, like the January, like no, December thirty first, twenty twenty two, and I was just with Laganja all night, and then I was like, well, these are my last drinks. She was like, what? <laughs> and then I like I went home. <laughs> she doesn't. She didn't know that she was like part of like wow. my. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, now it probably that probably is like if you were ever at a moment where you're like, should I drink again? I feel yeah. like that is a pushing force to be like, no, because then you're not gonna be able to say that was your last time drinking. Or I'd have to find Laganja again. Again, yeah, recreate that situation <laughs> yeah. on yeah, December thirty yeah. first of another year. Seriously. So I want to know how do you feel like alcohol played into dating for you? Did it was it something? Did you use it as a crutch? Did you not feel affected by it whatsoever when you were dating? What was your relationship to alcohol and dating? Okay, so um, I am also autistic, and so like I have a very hard time relaxing, and so especially um, I forgot we were on a podcast for one second. I was like, I know you <laughs> told me that yeah. we're friends, and then I was kind of like, why is she saying that to me? Yeah. And then I remember because they were on a podcast. Okay, sorry, you're autistic. Yes, and so there's like mainly two reasons that I identified why I drink. So for social lubricant, obviously, like, and especially when I moved from South Carolina here, I was like, I want to do the whole gay thing, like really do it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, is like in South Carolina, I did date like women, but yeah. there was like more dudes, and I was I got fired, and I was like, I'm moving to LA, so I want to give it the old college try in yeah. Los Angeles, and so drinking like helped me ease into. Not only was I like bad socially, I had never like fully committed to like dating a woman at that yes. point, and you know when you're newly newly minted gay you know you're just like nervous all the time yeah. so i was like just drinking the main reason why i drank was like to help with my just anxiety in general but that's yeah and so like i did drink to date it was kind of interesting one of the first dates i went on with like this lesbian um in like december or november of 2019 i was drinking and she was like um she said like i drank two drinks really quickly and she's like are you getting drunk because you're you need like courage to sleep with me and i was like i'm getting drunk because i have a problem <laughs> <laughs> don't flatter yourself sweetheart yeah. and also that's pretty presumptuous but yes also but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah did you sleep with her uh yeah yeah Good. Okay. later on <laughs> wow a yeah. self-fulfilling prophecy mm-hmm. yeah wow. so i have used it i um talked about with this about this with my therapist like i'm uh newly not new to sober sex but a large portion of my life i've spent intoxicated my sexual life and so it's like uh now i'm i'm getting like serious about sex because like when you're drunk you can just goof off you know yeah <laughs> and so now i'm like you said i gotta get down to business i gotta take this seriously yeah getting sober like made me like more of like a lesbian because i was like you had to look in someone's eyes and how are you doing yeah. you know <laughs> I do feel like that would be hard if you were used to like only having yeah. sex drunk. That does feel very uh, revealing to do by your, yeah. like when you're fully sober. Yeah, you're like, what goes in where? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa. No, seriously, and also like, I mean, doing it in broad daylight is just so jarring. <laughs> You know? I think that's true for alcohol or not. I think that's true for anyone because stuff will happen. I feel like when 
I was gonna say when I when we are having sex in the daytime, sometimes I'll look over and I'll just realize I'm wearing my Fitbit, yeah. and I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> I'm having yeah. sex and wearing a Fitbit. Yeah, like, you'll hear your dogs like, yeah, and then like the washing machine is like, it's like too much. God's eyes can see you during the sunshine. Like it's too much to have sex during the day. No, seriously, you're so aware, and like any insecurity you have, and I mean like I don't mind my body, but like sometimes. Sometimes I'll like get a like, full glimpse in broad daylight, and you're like, what are we doing? The worst I've ever felt about myself is one time when I was changing clothes after the gym, but I didn't want to take my sneakers off because I was about to leave the house again immediately. And I caught a side view of myself fully nude in the mirror, but I was still wearing like ankle socks and sneakers. <laughs> and I was like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. It was so upsetting. Oh. I do feel like when people talk about, like, filming themselves having sex, I am always like, wow, I don't think I, I think that's a very specific thing to people who are oh, very yeah. conventionally hot, maybe, oh, <laughs> because yeah. the thought of, like, you and I sitting down, we would not be able to not, co- I I would not be able to at least not, I would, I would be like, oh, look at me there. Oh, don't <laughs> look away. Yeah. Wait, not this part. And the whole time we'd be filming it, I'd be like checking the angle. And I be feel like, like yeah. it would, if you filmed it, it would have to be kind of up close. Oh, yeah. Because if there's too much mise-en-scene and the, the you know what i mean like yeah. i don't need to see my whole room <laughs> you said the bit bit plugged in yeah next yeah, yeah. To the bed. <laughs> you said oh my god no seriously i feel like my body is so white that if i were to like switch positions or like sit down momentarily and i got up everything would just be pink on one side <laughs> and then you just i would i would be focused on like watching it slowly fade and i'm like finally so normalcy sure <laughs> absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. wow i've never thought about that how going from drunk sex all the time to sober sex all the time it is so gay, honestly. No, I mean, like, it's gotten more serious. Uh, like, I mean, sex is serious, but, like, now I'm, I'm, Sometimes. Yeah, but now I'm, like, in it to win it, you know? I'm, sure. like, fully functioning. Yeah. Which is just, yeah. What are the highlights of sober sex compared to drunk sex for you? Mm, probably a bit more involved. Um, <laughs> I'm Well, I mean, like, you know, you get sloppy. You, like, you want to lay down and then, like, oh, close. You know, there we go. But, yeah. like, I feel like I'm, like, up and moving. Yeah. And I'm, like, pitching ideas. Because, you know, you're, you're bra- <laughs> yeah. your brain's not your sharpest when you're drunk. Sure. But now I feel like we're riffing. We're improv yeah. you know? I'm like, Naomi, get up my back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, uh, we're going to have Naomi on and then be like, no, since Sarah's gotten some of her sex, has been very scary. <laughs> it's, really it's, scary. Been, it's been really weird. They want me to do a lot of running oh, and yeah, a lot yeah. of uh, on the treadmill and yeah. a lot of stuff. But um, something I have been... Uh, Having to, so I have a hard time taking myself seriously, like getting into it. So I have gotten really into role play mm-hmm. because you know, like when you joke around because you're afraid of being vulnerable with people. Mm-hmm. In a similar way, in the bedroom now, I like act like stupid, sexy, like a, uh, you know, yeah, 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 just like over the top. So now yeah. I can like ease into sexuality, but I'm doing it ironically. <laughs> so I'm like. You know, like slowly transitioning. Mm-hmm. Wow! But Naomi now has to deal with this whole like you know pizza <laughs> delivery driver scenario. I love that. Until I'm ready. So you're doing different characters. You're not oh, just doing yeah. different versions of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your favorite character? Um, oh crap, crap, crap. Uh, trying to think. It's mainly a lot of teacher stuff. Oh, okay. Well, because Naomi's of a t- Poland. A teacher? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Oh. Oh, no. Naomi's also a tutor. Yeah. But, um, no, it's just, um, I like I like the teacher scenario. So, and what does that have to do with Naomi being from Poland? <laughs> I teach in English. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is funny, because Naomi speaks English. <laughs> Naomi does. <laughs> Not during sex. <laughs> no, but I mean, if you ask Naomi to, like, speak Polish, and then I'm like, now we're going to work on some... English oh. phrases. That's Wait, fun. that's fun. That's yeah. fun. Okay, we're going to try that out. I'm going to make <laughs> you speak Polish. <laughs> oh, I, I feel can. like you're learning Japanese, you're learning Spanish. It's just going to be like an intro to like both yeah. those languages. Yeah, Yeah. it's oh. like a classroom where the teacher left the room. <laughs> yeah. And we're just two students that don't speak the same language. Yeah. Oh, Could be man. sexy. But you had been in long-term relationships before you were sober. Yeah. What Do you think it's just like leaps and downs different now than when you were not sober? 
Yeah. Um, I guess I also was a bit of a different person when I was drinking. Yeah. It's like, um, like since getting sober, like since I got more drunk in the afternoon, I, that aspect of me is gone. So I have a pretty strong morning, Sarah, but afternoon, night, Sarah, I've had to create this new person. Yeah. Like I, when I originally got sober, like I would drive at night and I'd never driven at night because I was always wasted. And so when I was driving at night, I felt like a teenager because I was like the last time I drove at night was when I was a teenager. And so like afternoon Sarah just feels a lot younger. And so, yeah, and the same in relationships. I'm like there's like this new dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. Afternoon Sarah. Afternoon Sarah is a lot younger than morning Sarah. <laughs> what do you feel? What does she do? She just feels like early 20s. Uh, morning Sarah is like, you know, like a pediatrician. Sure. But like afternoon Sarah, I'm like, the world is full of love and potential. <laughs> I love wow. that. Yeah. And and what do you do? Like, what are your activities? Well, it's just easier to snuggle like when I'm feeling younger. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if that makes sense, but like I, I also, uh, the Vivans could uh, be that. You know, you don't want to <laughs> snuggle when you're like in productive mode sure Sure. yeah but um and then how that affects our like naomi and i's relationship i just like i'm discovering who i am with naomi and naomi's down for anything so yeah that's That's amazing well we're so happy for you thank you i want to know if you have advice for people who are thinking about trying out becoming sober Mm -hmm. either because they're alcoholics or they just want to remove drinking from their life or their dating life even yeah what is your initial advice for them okay so um, you have to think about, like, first off, why are you drinking? And you're like, because it's fun. It's not the reason. Like, is it your – most people have something secondary going on. Um, I've talked to a lot of people with, like, mental illness. Usually it's a way to, like, self-medicate. And so if you boil it down, to, usually people are like, I'm trying to bring down my nerves. Alcohol is depressant. And so if you know that you're trying to treat anxiety, I would first advise before you get sober, like to maybe see a mental health therapist, like to uh, get on medication or beta blockers. Beta blockers will save your life also the first month of getting sober. And then my uh, second thing is a lot of people have a very hard time finding motivation to get sober because a lot of people are like, well, I don't feel like I have the willpower, but a lot of things can be repurposed um, to be motivation. Like a lot of people who drink a lot, um, do you have something secondary going on? And most likely you're angry at something, whether it be the mm. world or whatever. And anger can be repurposed to spite. And spite is an incredible motivator. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm so serious. <laughs> I love that. Like if you're like, I can't by myself, will myself to get sober. Think about any person who's like treated you like yeah. shit or told you you can't. And that is now your motivation. Yeah. Put it on someone else. So like um, it can't go away, much like your willpower. And then my last thing that I would say is, um, okay, when you get sober, the first month is usually the hardest. um, And the first thing that usually happens is you're going to lose some friends. Um, So I would just uh, try to build a community of people, like not so much AA, but maybe Smart Recovery or whatever. Um, If you are, if you drink socially and your friends mean a lot to you, you're going to find, you have to find new friends almost immediately. um, Just because... If you miss them, you're going to go back to the habits yeah. that they also do. So immediately try to form a community as well. Yeah. That's yeah. I think as an adult, one of the best things that's ever happened to me is losing friends. Yeah. And I know that sounds bizarre, but there are so many people that you hold on to for so long because you feel guilt losing friends. Mm-hmm. But regardless of what it is, if you need support from your friends and they're not able to give it to you, yeah. they're either truly bad people or they're not in a place in their life to give you the support that you need which doesn't make them bad but it makes it where maybe right now is not the best time for y'all to be friends yeah and I think or maybe not even just not be friends but be more casual friends than you are yeah and I think that allowing that to happen and not demonizing yourself for it is great and has been very freeing for me oh no yeah like a lot of people like when you grow you experience like something similar to what people who get sober do you know you're gonna if you're doing something to better yourself and that's either gonna make your friends uncomfortable or if they love you regardless but you still bonded over that unhealthy activity they're gonna feel not kind of bored or confused to with what to do with your time so just um yeah mentally prepare for that yes yeah, do you, I, that's kind of, something in there reminded me of this, but do you feel like, oh, just losing friends, do you feel like, I know a lot of people who've had, like, partners when they're getting sober, 
and the partner still drinks, but they don't drink. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like if someone has a partner who's about to become sober, you would have advice for them? Or do you think there is a way to handle it in a way that is a little more thoughtful? Like, do you feel Mm -hmm. like maybe the first month they should not be like, what do you, how do you, would you say go about it? Um, so usually this is like traditional rules, but I think the traditional rules can be questioned. Usually if you get sober, you should try to not date for a year. Mm. That's the general rule, like the old people will tell you. But if you are living with someone or you're already dating someone, um, you have to establish some hard boundaries almost effectively immediately. Um, and that's what probably makes or breaks the yeah. relationship. Um, but, yeah, if you live with someone who is drinking heavily, that's going to influence if you start drinking as well. So uh, I try to sequester alcohol to one room or not have it in the house. Yeah. Like, just not easily accessible sort of thing. Um, because also a huge thing about, like, any sort of addiction is, like, hiding what you're doing. Yeah. Um, so it just, yeah. I think yeah, I think that's hard because I I totally agree. But I've seen so many TikToks online where someone is like, "I'm an alcoholic, but you know my husband mm-hmm. needs his beer. He needs it. Like he loves his beer. So like it's not. <laughs> why should I make him give up a thing just because I'm an alcoholic? And I'm always like, it sounds like your husband might be an alcoholic yeah. too. Because sure. I am like, if your partner can't give up alcohol. When they know, because I feel like if you're trying something, I would like, give anything up for you. Oh, thank you. Not but, even in a cor- not even in a corny way, but I'm just like, <laughs> he said, not even in a courthouse. Not even in a courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Sue me. Um, no, just I can't think of something where you were like, hey, I'm really struggling with this. I need us to give it up. I'd be like, I simply can't. Well, yeah, because even stuff to just naturally, like if you're like, oh, I'm trying not to like, like with my lupus, like, oh, I'm trying not to eat red meat. You, this is a bad example because you already don't eat red meat. But if I was like, I'm giving up red meat and you did, I feel like you'd be like, okay, we as a household will give up red meat yeah. for whatever. Yeah. So I'm like, if your partner is like, I'm an alcoholic and I'm trying to become sober, which is like such a positive thing and yeah. is so hard. If your partner's like, well, all right, but I'm still going to drink a beer. I'm like, first of all, I think yeah. you might have an issue, but also- Red flags all around. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you shouldn't expect your partner to give up something, but also I think um, it becomes more manageable to live with someone who's still doing the behavior if you're treating the secondary cause. Like, if you're, like, it's much harder if uh, you're going cold turkey, but if you, like, have some sort of medical help, some support system, then you can have more flexibility of, like, someone in your house who drinks a beer. But, yeah, I also I think it's different with dudes because men are just... <laughs> annoying as hell so they're like yeah but um and they're drinking a lot of beer they're drinking I, oh, they a do. lot of I beer i cannot believe i've talked about this before but when i was younger i had so many memories with like my friends parents mm-hmm. where their dad was just always drinking a bud light like yeah. every moment i've ever seen this man multiple dads i can remember drinking a bud light you would go out with them on an excursion in their cars just like crash bud light cans like yeah. and, and i remember as an adult until like a couple years ago, I think I said to someone, I was like, well, Bud Light doesn't really have that much alcohol in it. And someone was like, that's a beer. I mean, yeah. yeah, it does. And I was like, wow, I think I assumed that because all these men growing up were drinking like 30 Bud Lights a day. I think that's one of the most wild things about becoming an adult is realizing how many people's parents, like parents of your childhood friends, were driving you drunk places. <laughs> oh, God. And I think that is so well. Like now looking back, I'm just like, oh, her mom was definitely an alcoholic and yeah. she was driving yes. us to after school play practice or whatever, yeah. you know? Yeah. My parents are not really big drinkers, so I don't have that with them, just to be clear, because I know my mom listens to this podcast. But <laughs> other people's parents, I think, would drink more than I personally would now as an adult. You don't adult. think they were like plastered yeah. driving you, but it would yeah. be like they'd, they'd had more two, than I would. They'd had three glasses of wine and are driving you around. You're like, uh, yeah. you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't know as a kid. Also, like the time, because, like, I mean, we're none of us are children of the 80s, sure. but like p- requiring a seatbelt was like an 80s yeah. sort of thing. So I can imagine, like, it, and people, like, there was like interviews where people are like, I'm not wearing a seatbelt when I'm driving. And it's like yeah. now even. The hardest of Republicans are like, yes, I wear seatbelt. A hundred percent. Well, know, I guess there was the same thing with the dr- drinking and driving. Like yeah, that no, used or to be like legal. Smoking and smoking in a mm-hmm. like a diner. Like yes. that was so yeah. cool in the nineties. Now it's get out of here. You know, <laughs> that's like, what it is. such a weird thing to cling to. I've always thought that because there are videos of people being like, "What do you think about not being allowed to drink and drive?" And people are like, 
that's my right if I want to. And they're so angry. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, if you're an alcoholic, I guess I would understand why you'd be so fired up about this law. But the seatbelt thing, I'm like, why do you care so much? Um, People but- don't understand what a right is. <laughs> oh, yeah. People always wonder, that's my right. I'm like, is it? Yeah. It's I guess not. you do have a right to die. But but even when we went to Louisiana, uh, it's like big there that you can get a, what is it? You, you can can't to- drink you and can't drive. Drink it, but yeah. You can get a daiquiri at a drive through but you have to leave the straw closed and you, you know, so you're not supposed to drink the daiquiri. You can buy it and take it home. You're not supposed that's, to drink it while you're driving. That's what uh, New Orleans and Savannah, Georgia have in common. You could walk around and get drunk. Yeah. And Vegas. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Vegas. Oh, Are you allowed? Loves Vegas. I love Vegas. Are you really allowed to drink publicly in Vegas? Or is it just like they couldn't start cracking down on that because it'd be too many people? Yeah, I think it'd be too many. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, now is the portion of the episode where we're going to dig into some audience questions. The heart and soul of the podcast. The heart and soul. If you want to ask a question for a future episode, we always list prompts on our Instagram, so go follow us. You can also go to our Instagram and find an email link where you can ask questions as well. Um, So today, we asked a couple questions. We asked if anyone had just general questions about dating and alcohol and if Uh anyone had questions about dating while sober. Yeah. Um, So... If you have any advice for them, let we're going to read them and you'll let us know. <laughs> okay, I was like, I, I thought that was going to be it. And I was like, okay, well, let's well, let's go. I don't know. Narrow yes. it down. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the first person, I think this is a great question. How to find a queer community when sober? Okay. Um, Tough. So, uh, yeah, a lot of LGBTQ culture is bar culture. Yes. Because, I mean, you're kicked out of the house or, you know, you can't go to, like, normal places to meet. So, um, yeah, there's definitely, like, online – I mean, I know in Los Angeles they have, like, events. Yeah. The only thing that really sucks about the the lesbian events is, like, if they're not drinking events, they're, like, a hike at, like, 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That is really true. I have gone to uh, – a couple sober it wasn't like specifically mm-hmm. labeled as sober but there it wasn't really a drinking event for lesbians and every time they made me play flag football it's like oh. let us rest please I, i'm sorry. not interested in that they, well, i didn't even they guess they didn't make me play it because i said no but yeah. i was like what else are we supposed to do so i just sit by the snack table but i'm like and then there's always ultimate frisbee mm-hmm. there's i'm like please so if you're not so if you're not into that much movement and you're not into drinking, it can be tough. Yeah, but there are, like, community events that are, like, you can find um, people. Of, also, just think of, as I said, like, really think about, like, lesbian or gay stereotypes, and most of them are true. Um, so if you want to meet a gaggle of lesbians, yeah. go to a, a women's sporting event. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. like, yeah, I um. This is a sober thing because you had to be legally. Um, so I did a uh, a wood shop class, <laughs> and I was like, I'm not. Ex- I didn't. Ex- I didn't go for the gays, but I was. When just, did you do this? Um, a couple years ago, <laughs> but it was all lesbians. So like, and just uh, usually I don't say lean into stereotypes, but really go down the list of what queer people like to do. And if you sign yeah. up for a class, you will find the gays there. Yeah, take like a, a falconing class. Yes. Uh, improv class. Mm-hmm. Uh, I no, mean, seriously, improv? Stuff, good stuff. Improv's a good one. I did a pottery class and just the amount of wolf cuts. I was like, <laughs> if I was single, this is my community. I've done a neon bending class, but granted... <laughs> That was for couples on Valentine's Day. I will say the one kind of class where you might not meet as many gay people is a cooking class. Mm. Because oh, yeah. most gay people either do not cook on principle for some reason or already know how to cook. <laughs> we I don't find a, a lot of gay class. people looking for cooking classes. Yeah. That's a straight couple thing. We took a cooking class. First of all, it feels like you're on one of those bachelor dates where they set you up with like, we had we took a yeah. pasta making class. And we loved it, to be clear. It was so fun. We were the talk of that cooking class people, people were shocked were they were like sisters yes. and we were like wives and they <laughs> were like <gasps> wow like people yeah. loved it yeah, people so could not popular. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. people cannot believe it there was these two women who were taking it together and we at first were like maybe another lesbian couple yeah. they were not they were first of all they were blackout drunk and they were like 40 year old best friends they were obsessed with us and she kept being like my daughter is getting into the gay thing but you know she <laughs> is always dating <laughs> these assholes and yeah. I was like oh I mean that you know that's just part of yeah. growing up and so everyone was really excited for us so yeah if you want attention mm-hmm. maybe take a straighter class yeah. yeah I also think don't hesitate to create your own community oh yeah and I think you can also do that in unconventional ways like going on apps that are intended for dating yeah make your tinder bio looking for people to go bowling with or something like that yeah and you probably will get responses from people being like i love 
bowling yeah. and then be like, cool, I'm going to put together a group of people that have messaged me that want to go bowling yeah. and then go bowling. And well, now there yeah. are things like Bumble Friend, also Lex. You can post anything on Lex and yeah. meet people. That's the one nice thing about if you're in the lesbian part of the LGBTQ plus community because mm-hmm. they are eager to do stuff. Oh, we yeah. do this dating show at the Upright Citizens Brigade where yeah. we invite like uh, people to... Uh, it's like a dating show. Yeah. And gay men, never interested. Anyone, never interested. Lesbians, we always have like 50 lesbian applicants. We're like, please yeah. let me do this dating show. They love doing stuff. They love to do a thing. Mm-hmm. We love doing stuff. <laughs> but do you feel like if you're newly sober and you're yeah. like, oh, I want to go, the, this bar is having a lesbian night. Would you be like, don't go to that? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say uh, newly sober, go to that. But I mean, I like to go to bars with my friends now that I feel like fine. Um, but I, I, there are so many, anything with sports, which is inherently gay, like you can just go to watch women's sports. The Yeah, yeah what you were saying about the classes, cooking is a straight man's game. Um, like class, straight man's class. If you're good yes. at cooking, that is great. But like I'm saying that when a- <laughs> you're careful not to offend me, because no, you yeah, know I'm, I'm good like, at cooking. No, but I'm saying you know when you think about straight couples, they're like our oh, relationships on the rocks. Let's do something, to switch it up. Cooking yeah. class is where they go. Of yeah. course, they're easy, they're accessible, and yeah. the woman is praying to God that the man might learn something that he will then recreate outside of the class. Yeah, yeah. if you like, look for the more unconventional the gayer it gets. Um, yes, any, be specific. Yeah, butterflies. Uh, any thing with painting <laughs> any book club really um, i will say pottery is hit or miss because your pottery class sounds like there's a lot of gay people when we took a pottery class it was a lot of old women and they were all very confused and it was on <laughs> it was the wheel like you, yeah what's it called pottery wheel um and i just remember this woman across from me was holding this it was like 30 minutes in the class she's holding this lump of clay and she looks at me and she goes this is not what i wanted <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's, this is not what I was trying to make. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the great thing about pottery is it's not the classmates. It's the teachers. Mm, Those, she was gay. Yeah. She was gay. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Next question I remember off the top of my head. Someone Can't asked that. favorite mocktail. Favorite mocktail. Um, okay. So uh, carrot juice mm-hmm. with ginger <laughs> beer. Yum. Ooh. So, so good. Are On you- ice? Yes. <laughs> What's crazy about no. that? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, are you making the carrot juice or are you buying carrot juice? I, I can't do that. I um don't have a juicer. No, I yeah. don't buy a juicer. That's I don't the know. Brand. How. I want you to plug a brand so people can check out your carrot juice. It's that one that looks like it's not English, but it it it's written mm. in English letters. What? Oh wait. It lo- like it could be Russian. Uh, I where think do you I buy it? Do know. The store. But it's just Sarah. sorry. It's our, <laughs> the store. No, the okay, store. we'll put a picture of it in our Instagram story once this yeah. episode comes out. I'll have you send me a picture of your carrot juice because mm-hmm. no, I want to know. Don't try to buy a juicer. Have you ever tried to clean a juicer? Ooh, no. Every time don't. juicers are one use. I bought two juicers every time thrown out the next day. I okay. Okay. No one come for it. us. We donated them. We didn't throw them out. Oh, I, I can't clean it. I'm like, well, I, there's no way to clean. Yeah. And somebody like I do celery juice every morning. I'm like, it must be just. Not hygienic because there's no way to yeah. clean this. Yeah. When you go to a bar, what do you order? Um, anything with uh, like a soda in it. So like for mocktails, it's obviously not alcohol, but you want to drink it as if it were. Um, so I'd recommend literally anything with bubbly stuff in it so you can't chug it. Um, just so you have the pace of if you were drinking. I see. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Okay, someone said, sorry if this episode specifically seems like we're really just throwing questions at you, but we I love don't it. have all, we don't have uh, the answers that you have. Um, <laughs> Why are you apologizing? This is specifically what we told her. I know. Been. I just feel like I'm like, okay. Uh, and I'm really, you know, no, yeah. you're giving us a lot of knowledge. So I'm appreciative. I, of I love being asked questions. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so someone says, I think my partner might be an alcoholic. Uh-huh. How do I confront them? You don't. Uh, the worst thing to do is tell someone they're an alcoholic unless you want the friendship to end immediately. The thing is, is what really sucks about that is, um, yeah, it, a lot of people are heavily in denial. And so what happens is they now start to hide from you. Um, it's like if you think about like an eating disorder, would you ever want to confront someone about an eating disorder? Like, sure, it could be hurting them. But like, what is the best way? And the best way would be um, so there's this is not. 
you have to better yourself to help the people around you. And you're like, that's not immediate. It is. Like, there's this uh, uh, program called Al-Anon, which is a support group for the people who are in relationships with alcoholics. And so what they found that works is if you truly invest in yourself and you start to make more healthy changes, your partner is going to see that. And so they would get indirectly inspired. And I know that's not the direct method. The direct method, especially if they're ruining their life, would be to tell them. Um, but interventions don't usually go the way that you want. Um, yeah. So I would invest as much as you can in yourself and model the behavior and the relationship with alcohol that you'd like to see them have. Um, because, I mean, like, it's... They, they're going to have to come to terms with them themselves. Yeah. What if your partner is like, why are you going to Al-Anon? I'm not an alcoholic. Um, well, Al-Anon is m oh, for a lot of codependent relationships. Mm -hmm. And so you could lean into that aspect of it. Um, so like because people who in Al-Anon usually are codependent with their partner. And they're just feeling like you could say, I am feeling a little bit codependent with you. And that's a way to say that there's a problem in our relationship mm -hmm. that's not necessarily yeah. about the alcohol and I want to know how I can invest in myself to invest in us and um, you know make it like see that you are a team but you also need what's going to help you is you're now going to have a bunch of people on your like with you that are like in the same spot yeah yes yeah yeah I'm also sure that can feel very isolating if, yeah like, the one person who's kind of especially if you're codependent I guess who's like the one person you spend most of your time with they're able to but you are keeping this thought to yourself or this thing about that I think you're an alcoholic to yourself mm -hmm. that would be very isolating yeah and I mean like couples go on dates and hang out and so if you befriend people that are in codependency groups they're gonna come over now you're gonna have two people bettering themselves you potentially have the ability to connect the two people with the drinking problem together mm. and like you're I would never don't underestimate your influence on your partner yeah. you know I read a lot and Naomi who hates reading I've seen them reading sometimes so like they will pick up on what you're putting down um I just can confronting someone is uh I know it seems like you really want to do it but like also it's not effective. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's bad or selfish to break up with someone because you think they're an alcoholic? No, I think it's not selfish at all. I think it's like you, um, a lot of people do need a wake up call. Uh, they don't need be, to be yelled at, but like usually what inspires change in someone is like, I mean, if one of my friends stop being my friends because, and they said like a very specific issue, even if I was in denial about it, I would still ponder it and try to work on it and like yeah. work through it um you have to like tr staying in a relationship in a, the hopes to better someone else is controlling behavior even yeah. if it is for the better in your mind um so you really only can control yourself and invest in yourself yes and so it's not selfish okay i think mm -hmm. some people need to hear that it's not yeah i think honestly in general <laughs> breaking up with someone is fine <laughs> yeah I even if you're like it's one of the best things you can do because I think yeah because I think I'm always just like whenever I've had a friend come to me and be like I don't know should I should I not and I'm like well if you don't do it there could be a negative outcome which could mm -hmm. be you either both of you are unhappy for a long time and maybe there's a chance that you guys work through it and you're fine but also if you break up with them there's only good outcomes you'll both be okay uh -huh. and you'll both get through it and then you'll both probably find someone else and you'll both be fine and happy that it happened I don't think the breakup is ever going to be I guess there's there are some people who are like I cheated on my girlfriend 30 years ago and it's all I ever think about. But I think there's probably mm -hmm. some more stuff going on there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I think the one that got away is always kind of a weird. Uh, I don't feel like that's something that I've ever. It better not be. Uh, no, I, I just think whatever was like the one that got <laughs> away. I'm like, that's so say? interesting. Oh, I guess the only I've had people who've been like, well, I dated this person. They ended up being really famous or really rich. I'm yeah. like, yeah, but oh, you I just guess, regret but... not being rich because yeah. you want to be rich. Yes. You're not like, I miss them, you know? But yeah. I do, I agree. I think there's only two outcomes when you break up with someone. Either you were right for each other and you get back together. Yeah. And then you've grown separately and are now in a better place to recommit to each other. Oh, yeah. Or you both find people who are better for you. And yeah. I've only exclusively ever experienced that in my life. Mm -hmm. And I so firmly believe in that. Yeah. And a, yeah. a lot of people, if you break up with a, like an alcoholic and you're worried that like without me, they won't be able to survive. The thing is, is again, that's a codependent relationship um, and it's controlling. And often sometimes, and it, I don't want to say like you need to hit a rock bottom, but like a rock bottom is incredibly moving. Mm. Yes. Yes. And I'll say this. 
Um, speaking from a place of being in relationships with people who are addicts or who have been addicts, I think that sometimes there is that fear of the worst case scenario. I know I had that for a long time. Mm-hmm. There is nothing you can do. And sometimes, sadly, the worst case scenario does happen to that person. Yeah. That's still not your fault. Yeah. Yes. Um, there's nothing you could have done mm. to change that. Because like you were saying, Sarah, you only have so much control over another person yeah (laughs) you really only have control over yourself so you can support someone you can be there for them but you can't stop someone Mm -hmm. from having the worst case scenario happen if they're not ready willing able to help themselves yeah and that's I mean like if you're going to break up with someone they probably not immediately the first sign of danger but um yeah just prepare yourself mentally also there's this thing in like harm reduction where it's like good is not the enemy of great so, like, you want, like, the perfect outcome for everyone, but sometimes the good option is the is the good option. You don't yeah. need the great option. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think people who are like, I'm a perfectionist. I'm like, no, you're annoying. Mm-hmm. You're <laughs> annoying. You yeah. need to go to therapy and talk about yeah. control because mm-hmm. there's no such thing as perfect, as corny as that sounds. Yeah. There's no such thing as perfect. What are you talking about? Yeah. People be like, oh, sorry, I'm the perfectionist. What? What are you even talking about? Yeah. Well, I do. Yeah, because I, th- I think that even, uh, like, if you think that your partner couldn't survive without you, yeah, they probably also feel that way to some degree. Uh-huh. And I think even this is on a way smaller scale, but I find I do this with Jordan sometimes where Jordan is very good at like uh, navigation and like planning stuff. And, uh-huh. and so I can sometimes find myself, like if I'm on my own, I can navigate all the stuff I can yeah. do. But if Jordan's around, I kind of like my brain is like, you don't have to be as on right now. Like yeah. when we're driving a place, you can just be head up in the clouds not if we're walking somewhere I don't need to look before I cross the street because Jordan's gonna look before he crosses the <laughs> yeah. street I'm not gonna get hit by a car whereas when I'm by myself I'm much more like alert on whatever and on a bigger scale I'm like I assume that if someone is really just um, I, I think if you're in a really codependent relationship the way they would act on their own is not the way they're ever gonna act in a relationship Yeah. and if it is then they gotta figure that out but I think it makes being fully by yourself does make you step up because you have to yeah. to survive and I would say, like, to anyone, um, like, uh, if you're, like, worried about how the alcoholic will deal with it, I've had, like, people leave my life, and it frustrated me at the time, but now I completely understand. If they were to circle back and be like, I'm sorry I left, I would be like, dude, I've had some time to process it, and what you did was totally justified. Mm-hmm. And ob- like, there, you're not going to get that clarity immediately, but it it can come. Did you feel like you had a rock bottom? Mm, I just, um, I got, uh, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. But not like, yeah. Yeah, because I, I feel like there are some people where they're like, I've lost everyone. Yeah. I've lost every single person. or th- And I think that is super hard, but. I didn't lose everyone. I just lost myself completely. Oh, yeah. that's hard. What's the biggest thing that's helped you find yourself again? Um, doing everything that I thought I couldn't. I, um, like I, last year when I got sober, I, well, I mean, I've never thought that I could get sober. I never thought that I could do stand up and I got into stand up. Like this year I've read so many books. And you are reading more than anyone has ever read in the history of the earth existing. I love reading cause I love learning. I, like I said, I, I haven't, uh, afternoon Sarah is a, ch- <laughs> is a child and she has such a, squishy brain I feel like I I just want to learn and I want to know the thing is is okay this is the other thing about getting sober if you're worried if you're like life is rushing me by you're about to life time is about to go so slow because usually you can drink and then time disappears when you get sober time slows down immensely like I feel like I could do everything in one day and it's like only 5 p.m. um so how do I find myself just do everything that you literally have told your told yourself you can't yeah. Like, I mean, it, do it and be embarrassed, you know? That's, yeah. yeah. I think there's something so, I mean, I, not sober, but I had such a hard time in school growing up and I like mm-hmm. couldn't read or really do a ton of uh, intaking information. And I feel like now as an adult, I do have this very childlike want to learn yeah. anything and everything I can because I'm like, oh, it's so fun to learn. And I've always enjoyed learning 
but I did, I couldn't do it because yeah. I couldn't remember anything. So I feel like getting sober could be similar in that way. Yeah, I mean, like I like I felt stupid in school because the grades. But the thing is, is like I've taken like classes as an adult. I've also read. There is no grading scale. Like you're talking about the perfectionism. When you take a class as an adult, everyone's like, "Oh, I don't want to mess this up." Everyone in the class is messing it up. Everyone has burned something. Someone's shirt is stuck in the kiln. <laughs> like you are. Like <laughs> literally, everyone is bad at something for the first time. Yeah. And it's like when you learn and there's no grades. Mm -hmm. Like or if the teacher serving wine you get drunk you forget what you're doing halfway through that's fine because this is not school yeah. you are allowed to fail and everyone else is failing with you yeah, yeah. I love that I keep telling Kendall that I think she should go back I think Kendall should go to community college I think you'd really really like it yeah well because I, I'm trying to learn Japanese yeah and I know that I need to like get into a class because I uh you know Duolingo is great but it's I, I am know I'm gonna get into this position where I can read Japanese but I can't speak Japanese oh and yeah when someone speaks to me I'm not gonna be able to understand it which is like the most helpful thing yeah. I would want to be able to do um so I was like I really want to go take a class but I immediately kind of got this like oh, I don't want to take a class because I just you know the last time I took a class I was in high school and I was failing it and the yeah. I, every experience I've had in a classroom has been negative um and even in, I went to acting school and we had one like traditional class I think so they could be an accredited school yeah <laughs> and I failed that class I couldn't pass it and he had to pull me aside and be like you're failing or you're not doing your homework you're not passing me the test and I was just like I don't know I I've never had an experience where I had a good relationship with class so I think I felt worried because I'm so motivated right now to do yeah to learn Japanese I was like I have a feeling that if I get into class I'm going to become very unmotivated because I'm going to feel like I'm failing and everyone else is so good at it and I'm not. I'm getting in trouble and I'm failing and I'm so uh -huh. I got nervous. But I think I should just jump in there. Maybe it'll be healing. I agree. Yeah, I think it would. And I think um, like taking a like taking a Japanese class as like an older person, I would just hang, sit with the older people. Yeah. Because they probably have the same brain <laughs> like I as know. you. Like if you sit with all the young kids whose brains are like still like malleable, then yeah, yeah I'd feel self-conscious. But if I'm with somebody who's like 40. Yeah, maybe I should go take classes at a retirement home. There you go. I should take like yeah. what they offer like chess classes there. <laughs> take, a, take a class where you know you can't be the worst. Yes, exactly. There you go. Yeah. You, because I, I did become very like, uh, I would, when when I, as an adult, I feel like I will take classes in things I already know I'm good at. Yeah. Like I would take improv classes or I would take classes mm -hmm. that I knew I was going to, or even now, like I try to listen to these history podcasts because I didn't intake any history information, yeah. but I can feel myself picking history stuff I already know. Like I listened a couple weeks ago about the Donner Party where I, and I'm from Northern California. So the Donner Party is like crammed into our brain from a very the Donner Party age. is um, <laughs> the serial killer? And no, no. Where they, it's, they. That's Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh. They tried. Sorry. <laughs> Jeffrey Sorry Dahmer. The Dahmer Party. <laughs> Jeffrey Dahmer Party. Uh, uh, no, the, the Donner Party, they, why are you laughing? I've already brought this up on the podcast. No, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about, depending on where you're from, the things that you learn in school. Yeah, because you probably learned so, about something weird being from Florida. Well, two things. So I grew up between New Orleans and Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. So the amount that I learned about alligators is truly <laughs> unparalleled. Yeah. And then also things like, I recently learned that not everyone knows so much about the Fountain of Youth and Ponce de Leon. <laughs> yeah. That's a huge thing in Florida. You know all about it. You go up there, you drink that water that smells like eggs. Like, it's a huge thing. And it always makes yeah. me laugh when you meet other people from other places and it's like, oh, this was the thing that, that was you big learned. to learn Because you were from South in, Carolina. You know? Yeah, so. I mean, I went to high school and middle school all up the East Coast, like Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina. And so it's it's a mixed bag, but it's a lot about the Civil War. Sure. Um... Damn. What was, like, the place you guys would visit? Well, see, when I went to high school in Northern Virginia, we would go to Washington, D.C., mm. which just, the National Mall. I mean, you've seen it once. You've seen it. <laughs> you know? It's not the best mall, I'll say that. No, yeah. seriously. And then when I went to high school in Beaufort, South Carolina, the we would go to Charleston, mm. see that, that damn army place. Yeah. Yeah, this, or whatever. But so, yeah, it's just always military stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I will say, I think Northern California had some interesting stuff. <laughs> we had the Donner yeah. Party, and we had uh, a lot of cults. Um, <laughs> and a lot of, you know, the gold rush, and, and mm -hmm. we would go visit. But the Donner Party, they were, uh, people were, and I'm. what's embarrassing about this is that I learned about this growing up, listened to a podcast, and I am going to get this wrong okay <laughs> but the gist of it was people going over donner pass and they've been told you know everybody's coming from all over america to come to northern california to that area to get gold um and they're told they're just gonna have this amazing life in california mm -hmm. and uh 
they are told to go this specific route and people, the route ended up not being good. Uh Um, And so they couldn't really take it, but it was kind of too late. Cause you also forget how long these people are traveling. Like by the time they'd figured out it was a no go. Yeah. You're like, why didn't they turn back? And it's like, well, they turned back. It's like uh, two months. Like you can't really do that. And so then it started snowing and then they got stuck in the snow Uh and then they were all getting sick and died and they had no food. And so they are famous because they all ate each other. Oh my God! And Absolutely. there are living members of the Donner Party. Uh, I don't know if they. Uh, let me. I don't know if they are living now, but they, <laughs> yeah. are, they survived. They survived yeah. the Donner Party. One of them might be living now. I actually, there's no way. When no, did the Donner Party? I'm happen? pretty sure the youngest girl. There's a girl who married a guy, and it's very sad because the dad was like, "He's not coming on the on the trip." And I don't remember why. I think he was just, like, probably being an overprotective dad. Yeah. He was like, your husband's not coming on the trip. He needs to work the farm here. And the husband was like, please let me come. I love my wife. And then he got eaten. But um, that woman who was his, uh, she had to eat her father and her husband. Do you think you could eat me if you needed to? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you think you could eat me if you needed to? <sighs> What are the, what are the circumstances? You need to. That's I all need. you got right now. <laughs> if you're in the Donner Party, you need to. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, is like I, I don't want to survive this. I feel that so strongly. First of all, let's all notice how much more Sarah thought about it than Kendall. So that's the first <laughs> yeah. thing to take Sarah in. Sarah was like, I will not eat. Kendall to... did no, not skip I a beat. I just think I can compartmentalize very well. I think that I would not be, first of all, I wouldn't be like, pass me the ketchup. I wouldn't be having like a good time. Of course I would be. But I think I would be more affected by you dying, which in the Donner Party, it's not like, they weren't killing people based on it Looks wasn't like yellow hotness. Jackets. Yeah, <laughs> it, it wasn't like we were like we're gonna vote. We're gonna who's yeah. gonna eat? It was like you probably would have already been dying. I think that would be the thing that would affect me more than like then someone goes and like grills you up and you look like chicken and I can just go. I'm pretending this is chicken, not Jordan. Interesting. I think um, I have little reason to keep going for <laughs> a, no. I mean, I like I'm I, in the exact same boat as you. I love living but like i mean every time someone prevent like pr- uh, presents like this survival like would you rather end of the world zombies not I'm, for like, me just let's wrap this up <laughs> if i can no longer use my air conditioning or see three it movies a-, a week at amc yeah take me out it's not <laughs> this world is not for me anymore no <laughs> like seriously. i am not intended to be here for a zombie apocalypse mm, yeah I- i'm i'm like my dog and I, I can't control Kendall, so you can do whatever you want to do. Well, thank but- you for finally saying that, because in the past you've been like, if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, I'll just shoot me, Kendall, and our dog. And I'm so- like, please take me out of <laughs> okay, this. Okay, fine. I don't I'll shoot our shot. dog and myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just have no... I'm like, to live for what for yeah. why well, i guess I just, I just like the little things so you're not gonna have those yeah, i i will find a way if i'm in a bunker by myself no. if i, I can't go to jersey my friends yeah that's a wrap on me the thing wow. is is i am um, uh, but i wouldn't end it right away there's oh. uh, now that i know that the end is coming i do a bunch of crazy stuff mm. give us some examples oh i'd make meth i would <laughs> I would, I would, oh, I've been dying to do that. Cause I, already, yeah, I hear someone being like, zombies are approaching Seattle. And Sarah's like, I've got to go to the desert. <laughs> oh, no, but I'm so serious. Like I, I, I know that Adderall and um, meth are so vastly, but they're but chemically different. But like, I'm like, I know the end is near. I'm just going to try to do it myself and yeah. take it and see if it works. And if not, well, I'm already going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah. Wow. I don't even remember how we got started on the Donner Party, but somehow I thought it was related to being an alcoholic, but I don't think it probably, probably it wasn't. Well, you I probably know me. have to drink pretty heavily to forget. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, all those people probably were that little girl who's still alive, according to know. you. Yeah. I don't know. But, uh, no, all I know is I read, co- then later I went back and watched a video on the Donner Party, and one of the comments was like, she's still alive and she's thriving. And so I was wondering if maybe she was like a business owner. Who knows? <laughs> she's, no, she's in Congress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's, that's AOC. Yeah. <laughs> she was in the Donner Party. Oh, man. Oh, even I lo- Oh, but oh, oh I remember. Oh, okay. Sorry, and then I'll end it. But yeah. I just, I remembered it was because I have fear to listen to a history podcast I don't know anything about because yeah. I can't retain any of it. And I tried one time listening to a podcast, the same woman doing the podcast that she did the Donner Party, uh, she was talking about Watergate. Yeah. Because I was like, I look, I'm 24. I got to fucking learn what Watergate is. Oh, People yeah. have explained it to me 700 times. I did a school project on Watergate. I had to make a whole short film about it. 
if gun to my head, I could not tell you what yeah. really that was. I kind of know. So I tried to listen to this podcast episode where she's explaining so clearly and I couldn't get through it. I just kept being like, oh, I haven't been paying attention. Restarting it. Oh, I haven't been paying attention. But if I already know what it is about, yeah. I will I will, and I'll retain it because I kind of know the bones of what we're talking about. Yeah. So I find myself getting really knowledgeable about three topics. Yeah. And then no knowledge about of anything else. Yeah. I think that's any white collar crime. Really, for me, if you ask me to explain racketeering, I'm like, <laughs> no clue. And that's the same with Watergate. I'm like, it's, we, we lied to someone. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I don't get it. Do you know what it is? I know the raconteurs, which is Jack White's banned outside of the white stripes <laughs> but i probably couldn't explain racketeering to you that's interesting uh, they should look into him for money laundering or they something should, yeah, <laughs> yeah. why do you name his band that <laughs> listen uh, there's been a lot of history a lot of stuff has happened mm-hmm. and you can only know so much i'm like they should just teach the really cool stuff because i'm just like no nobody's gonna intake this and it doesn't really matter like a lot of yeah. stuff they teach you in history class I'm just like, nobody cares. Like, who yeah. imported what? And like, I just, all I remember learning in history class in high school was they were like, this was the biggest importer of wheat. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> and no yeah. one cares. I'm like, teach about stuff that was crazy. Yeah. Just so we at least leave, either we're leaving with no knowledge or we're leaving with a bunch of knowledge that is knowledge, but it's just really bizarre. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. like, yeah, the Donner Party, interesting. Titanic, interesting. <laughs> Wait, but I also... Pompeii? Interesting. I'm saying, if you listen to the BCC Club, I've told you about the difference between important and interesting <laughs> like know. a million times. You're, the, the Watergate is important, but it's not interesting. No. That's why I'm like, they should separate. That's why we need to get a real diagnosis for everyone with ADHD. Yeah. Separate the classes. The non-ADHD people can learn oh, what? boring stuff. So I gotta stuff? go to a class where I learn about Watergate just because yeah. I don't have ADHD? And then yeah. ADHD, we sit in a class yeah. and they show us uh, Marilyn Monroe singing Happy Birthday. <laughs> 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 and then we like learn about, like, she would have, like, third degree burns if you actually stood over, like, a like a heat vent A great like, like that. that. I mean, we don't know she didn't. Yeah, she could have had burns on her ass. Wow. Yeah. That's why her legs are worth so much money. <laughs> They've got a lot of proof. Isn't that true? Her, what? Aren't her legs scarring? Like <laughs> her legs? I heard she's that. She's dead. I heard that while she was alive, she was like insurance on her legs for like oh, a million while dollars. Oh, yeah. I've heard that about Taylor Swift. Yeah. Insurance on her legs? Yeah. So like mm. if something happens, you get a bunch of money. I don't Who? know. Who? She gets a bunch of money. If yes. she breaks her legs, she gets a bunch of money. <laughs> because I think theoretically it's like you make money off that part of you. So if you no longer can make money off that thing, yeah. you need help. I'm in something similar. USC. <laughs> What's insured on you, Sarah? <laughs> no, that's a USC College of Medicine has dibs on my legs. Wow. Yeah. So Would you doing... donate to science your body if you die? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Wait, so you've already given your legs when you die to <laughs> USC? A joke. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you said, okay, I haven't decided on my full body yet, but can I put down my legs yeah. for sure? I wasn't sure. I don't know what you have the option to do. I want to donate my butthole to the circus. <laughs> And everything else to science. <laughs> oh, man. Well, on that note, thank you so much for being here, Sarah. Yeah, thanks treat, for having me, guys. As always. An absolute treat. Thank you so much for listening to Happy Wife, Happy Life. You can listen to us on Apple Music, Spotify. As always, we're in the lovely Spotify studios. We, It's just the best over here. They have cheese. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? Stop <laughs> plugging it like that. They can't come here. <laughs> we love being here, though. We love recording in the Spotify offices. And follow us on all the social media. Join our Patreon. And if you want to know more about Sarah, Sarah, tell them where they can find you. You can find me at Sarah Shower, S-C-H-A-U-E-R, uh, on any social media platform. Also, Kendall and I have a podcast we together do. called the BCC Club. And we talk about random stuff on the internet each week. And we're just... Uh, it's just a blast. It is a blast. We have such a fun. It's it, we have so, what we by have the s- end of this podcast I cannot speak. You literally we have, have two podcasts. <laughs> I'm gonna make Kendall lay down on the floor after this episode <laughs> to compose herself. We have so much fun on the BCC Club because we really just talk about whatever we want. We do. I, any hyperfixation either of us have, we're like we got to talk about it. So it's very fun. We mm-hmm. might be talking. We're we talking a lot about mommy bloggers. Talk a lot about <laughs> anything we're interested yeah. in. Yeah, we talked about Paris. Oh my God, Perez Hilton. Perez Hilton. I, keep, I yeah. just found out Paris Hilton and Perez Hilton were two different people. <laughs> I thought Paris. I thought Perez Hilton was just a sassy way to say Paris Hilton. Oh yeah. Oh, and on that note, Sarah, thanks again for coming. We absolutely love them. And that's it. That's the pod. I love you, Kendall. Love ya.